I can see in your eyes, dear. It's hard to take for a moment more. We've got to burn the ships, cut the ties, send the flare into the night. Say your prayer, turn the tide, dry your tears and wave goodbye. Step into a new day. On this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
just wanted my heart And the story isn't over If the story isn't good And failure's never final When the father's in the room And failure's never final When the father's in the room
face I'll see my pain no more my fear will cease I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my
Hey guys, it is a pleasure to be with you again as we worship together. It's actually a blast to get to be here with these guys as they record. But we had just a couple of announcements, things we wanted to bring to your attention um, as, as we go into worship together this morning. Um, the first of those is this. If you have not yet had a chance to connect to the age group connections that Lori and I and Drew and Nikki are putting together, and you've got kids basically of any age who are part of this service with us, if you'll look back in the YouTube list, you should find teenage and uh, elementary school connections. Uh, Lori and Nikki are putting together uh, worship sheets and whatnot that you can find on our website. We want to continue connecting to you guys as a family as you worship together. And if you need any help with that, you can get in touch with Lori or I. She's Lori, L-O-R-I, at rabbitcreekchurch.org. I'm Corey, C-O-R-Y, at rabbitcreekchurch.org. And we would love to help you to connect to that. If you need some help, don't hesitate to reach out. Also, we've got age group programs kicked up and running at this point. You can find out more about those in the Church Center app. Men's retreat, women's retreat coming up. But speaking of the Church Center app, let me point you to one more thing. Um, we are actually going into our season of budgeting right now. We have our uh, SLT committee, our stewardship and leadership team, working together to prepare our budget for next year. And I need to tell you guys that one of the things that we've con continued to talk about is your faithfulness through this um, unusual unpredictable season and it's been incredible to have you be a part of that the church center app is one of the best ways to continue to do that as we continue to partner together to reach out to do ministry together to be able to touch lives across anchorage across alaska across the united states and quite literally across the world um, so thank you again for your faithfulness continue to join with us as we do that it's a pleasure to be with you guys Let's go back into worship. Hi, thanks for joining us for Rabbit Creek's online campus. I'm Josh, the worship and the outreach pastor at Rabbit Creek Church. And I'm joined this week by Drew over on our synthesizer and also singing with me. And we've got our drummer friend at JR that's going to be kicking back there. I hope that you guys are as excited as I am. So let's go ahead and begin worship this morning with a quick prayer. And then we'll jump into the song, Mighty to Save. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you, God, that you love us first. Thank you that your grace is sufficient to cover all of our sins and that your love never fails. And that we know that your love has provided for us an awesome salvation through your son. And that your, your salvation that you have offered us is good and it's trustworthy. So we rely on that and we worship you in spite of all of our failures. We know that you are good and that you will save us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One, two, three. Everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion. A love that's never failing. That mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of the Savior. The hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains, yes he can, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, the heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. 
One of the amazing things about being a follower of Jesus is that he takes our deadness and brings us into his life. He gives us his righteousness in exchange for our sins that he bore on Calvary's cross. Join us as we celebrate the life that he gives us by the song, Graves into Gardens. Search the world.
worshiping with us. Let's continue to do that by following as Pastor Mark leads us through the scriptures this morning. Welcome back to Rabbit Creek Church Online. I'm so glad you're joining us today. We're going to pick back up in the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to be talking about some preparations that Jesus made towards the end of his ministry and really the culmination of where the Gospel story is going. I want to remind you of the very way in which Mark began his Gospel. He says the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark jumped right in to the story and tells us he's writing good news, gospel, about Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, who is the Son of God. This sets the whole story in motion. And as we've gone through chapter after chapter, hearing about Jesus' storytelling to prove the truth of the kingdom of God, his, his mercies and his miracles, his power, and all of these ways that he has shown himself to be who he is and been able to do those things the Father placed him on the earth to do, we are now going to arrive in chapter 11 as the story continues. And in chapter 11, we find the events that are later to be known as Palm Sunday, and the text tells us very clearly why that is. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. As they, and this is Jesus and the disciples, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered that Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was late, already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Beginning with this account and going all the way through chapter 14, we're going to be looking at some preparations that Jesus made as he heads to his ultimate crucifixion and glorification. We're going to see five preparations that Jesus makes. Now keep in mind when we talk about preparations, and we're talking about things that Jesus got ready before he left. In other words, getting things in order so that before he left, to continue to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the right hand of the Father. He knew what was to come, and he did not want to leave people in the dark. He did not want to leave people unprepared, including himself. And so we're going to look at some of the preparations. And the first preparation we see is that he prepares the crowds. He prepares the crowds. And by this, he is going to be talking about 
who he is. And he gets to have this great experience of entering in the city of God, Zion, city of David, Jerusalem. And he goes in and the crowds realize as the crowds testify, as the disciples lead the way, as the palm branches come out, that he is fulfilling the Old Testament prophets. Even riding on the cult of a donkey is according to the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is fulfilling this not only through the ears people hear of him, but visually. You'll remember, even as early as last week, that Jesus is saying, do not tell people about me. Uh, the time is not right yet. Just don't tell who I am and what I'm doing. And in fact, when we saw the great story of him and the Syrophoenician woman, he, he tried to go into that area, into Syrophoenicia, uh, very quietly, but she found out about him and went straight for him. And then we find that the great transfiguration he tells Peter, James, and John not to tell anybody about the story quite yet. But now the news is public. He's going public, and the anointed one is getting to be welcomed by the crowds. And then the second preparation he makes is, is quite different. It's quite different. As I concluded reading that section of Scripture, we saw that Jesus, along that journey, has now arrived at the temple. He's now arrived at the house of God. He's arrived in that place where people's connect with their savior where God is seen through the artistry and the great majesty of the place as they look upon this massive temple and think of the glory of God as they look at the symbolism of his power and his might and his beauty and Jesus goes in and sees something that greatly disturbs him so not only is he preparing the crowds for what will come but he is preparing his house, his father's house. Look at verses 15 through 17. It says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? but you have made it a den of robbers. Is it not written? He's quoting from the Old Testament and saying, this is something you should know about. This is what the Father's house is all about. Now, if we look at the story, we might be a little confused. Uh, we see Jesus driving out people. Uh, this includes turning tables. We compare the gospel stories and we see uh, that Jesus is going in and making a commotion to say, and in one way, it could be much bigger than that, obviously. But we can see, if we're not careful, as if Jesus is losing his temper, that Jesus is losing his cool. I don't know about you, but I know what it is to lose my cool. I look back on those times and regret some actions I've made. This is not the case for Jesus. Jesus always did the will of the Father, and so this was truly in line with the Father's will, even though it may catch us off guard. But we find in Mark, and we find in John's account of this event, that there are ways in which we see Jesus preparing for this event. So not only preparing God's house, but preparing for his encounter with those who are misusing God's house. So again, look at verse 11, out of chapter 11 of Mark. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. So he has seen the temple courts the way they are. He sees the commerce, the way in which they are cheating the poor that they have to purchase uh, these animals, some large, some small, so they can give their sin offerings. But the people are charging them too much, and it's become a great place of commerce. It's not that he's upset with the, the sale of animals for offering. That's been in place since the Old Testament. But they're being overcharged, and they're taking that place of, of great worship and prayer and turning it into a, a place of thievery. It's, it's not the, the selling of items again, but it's the corrupt way in which they're doing so. And other type of business transactions made their way into the courts, not just those for religious worship. And the Bible says very clearly that Jesus saw everything as it was. But then it says, because it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. Because it was already late. We see an interesting note there in that text. What it tells us is, Jesus looks and sees the corruption. Jesus looks and sees things as they should not be. 
and he does not react. He chooses to place appropriate time to act, but does not react. So often when we lose our cool, we are reacting. We are letting the, the moment overtake us. And Jesus would not allow this. He knew something had to be done and he knew what needed to be done. But because it was late, he did not go into it full heartedly. He did not jump in to the problem. Now, John gives us another hint in this. If we go to John chapter two, it says this, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables and exchanging money. So he made a whip out of the cords and drove all the temple from all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Now, as we think about what John tells us here, is there's an interesting detail that John includes that is very important for us to notice. John tells us that Jesus saw these things, the, the sale of cattle and sheep and the mishandling of the money, the coins, and it says he made a whip. Notice it does not say he grabbed a whip or he, he found the closest whip laying by, but he made a whip. Mark tells us that Jesus went away because it was late. John tells us that Jesus made a whip. And so there is time to think. There is time to work through his mind what should i do and how shall i please the father in this one does not make a whip hastily and one does not leave because it's late hastily he is very intentional about what he does and so he prepares not only the crowds but then he prepares the people in the temple to realize that god's temple is a place of prayer and then he cleanses the temple itself he prepares it the location to again make it what it should be the next thing we're going to see, the third preparation we're going to see that Jesus makes is he helps prepare the people to see his rightful authority, his place of rightful authority. If we look at verse 27 in the same chapter, Mark chapter 11, talking about the disciples still, it says, they arrived again in Jerusalem. And while Jesus is walking in the temple courts, the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they ask. And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you what authority I am doing these, by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered, Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then he, he goes on to whet their appetites as he tells them about authority. He goes on to, to talk about ways in which his authority will be seen. Over in chapter 12, he he talks about the way in which he is going to be wetting the appetite in a way that is powerful. It says this, it says, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of law say that the Messiah is the son of God? The son of David, rather. David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. So first of all, in that first account we read, we see that Jesus is being asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus never wanted to fall for trick questions, returns a question. And they feel caught because they know that if they speak too highly of John the Baptist's baptism, then they're going to be tripping over their own words because they've condemned that. But if they say that it's simply of man, then they know the crowds are going to be upset with them because he was a hero of the Jewish people, John was. And so he doesn't answer the question. But then later in the next chapter, as we've just read, we get to hear about the connection between David and Jesus. And what he does a good job doing is explaining that he is superior to David. That even David, the great king of renown for the Hebrew people, spoke of a higher authority, of Lord. 
And so he says, the Lord will put things under his feet. And so David is saying that he is below, and Jesus is saying that I am before David. So he's telling the people, if you look back to hero king, I'm superior to him. Here is where my authority comes from. My authority comes from the Father. My authority comes as I am a God in the flesh. This is my authority. I do not have to speak on behalf of David. I do not have to speak on any higher authority. Even David is lower than I. And so he's preparing the people to recognize his authority. But then he goes on to help us prepare in another way. And this is where he prepares the people to live by the Spirit. To live by the Spirit. Now, this is the context of words that we hear in other places, particularly in Matthew 22. But listen to these very familiar words. Mark, 2, Mark 12, 28 through 31. It says, One of the teachers of the law came, and I heard him debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This is a wonderful way in which Jesus is helping the people understand what it means to live by the Spirit. What does it mean to help people to know how to live their everyday ordinary lives by the Spirit of God? How am I going to live as a good Jewish person in this first century? How am I going to be the, the parent I need to be? How am I going to be the farmer that I need to be or the, the one who is deal with commerce or the one who is involved in instruction or the student learning how to memorize the great words of God from the Torah? How am I to do this in a way that honors God? Now, they had so many laws. They had so many things that they could have focused on. There was the Torah. You remember we talked about the law and the prophets last week. Well, we're again talking about laws, those same laws. And they are, they are numerous throughout the Old Testament. And even in that number, difficult to have in our minds at all times to check myself. Am I following the law? Am I not following the law? Well, in addition to that, you had another document called the Talmud. The Talmud was this, and I believe at the beginning it was a good document. It was a document that the Hebrew scholars and teachers put together to help explain the law, to help the people understand how to bring the law into their everyday lives. For example, many of us know the command that thankfully Jesus updated, if you will, uh, command of the Old Testament, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Well, as different cultures, uh, the people uh, throughout generations moved into different cultures and had different customs and laws. Uh, the people had to know, how do I apply that statement of law into the modern context? I think about another law, talking about cleanliness of a man or woman in the nomadic peoples of Moses and the days following that. Well, now many of these people's descendants are in cities and places of many people dwelling, and you can't follow the same law in the same way as have to be cast out of the town and live isolated lives. So the Talmud would explain how does a person obey the law of Moses in a current context. And that's what the Talmud was designed to do. Unfortunately, it began to be used as a scripture unto itself, and the common person didn't know which was which, which is the law of God and which is a person's understanding of the law of God. But many of the first century peoples were uneducated to the point that they were not able to read, and so they had to rely completely upon their Hebrew teachers and had to trust them. What they say must be the word of God, and therefore I must follow it. And they would hear many different laws, not only from the law of Moses, but from the Talmud. And there was much confusion. And it's in this context that Jesus has asked this question. What's most important? And he says, love God and love your neighbor. This was a great way to teach the people how to live by the spirit of the law, that great preparation to do so. Even more so important, as Jesus is going to leave, they needed to know, without the ultimate rabbi, how to live this life 
for God. And that was the ultimate check and balance. I didn't have to go around with some law book in my pocket or tied around my arm to try to figure out how to deal with my relationship with the business person or how to be the parent or the student. What I need to do is look at the umbrellas under one, and that is to love God and love neighbor, those two umbrellas under one large one. And every action that I take and every way in which I am going to try to express myself throughout the day, every relationship I'm in, I look at it under the the analysis of the tent is what I'm doing loving God and our loving neighbor is it accomplishing that goal of following the greatest commandments of God if it's not I need to remove it from under that tent of my life if there's something I'm neglecting I look at that and say is that something I should be doing that would help me love my God and love my neighbor if so I need to bring that into my life I need to graft it into my life and that became the great way to understand how to live for God. As Jesus said, as we visited before, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So if I'm going to live by the spirit of law, I need to live by the code of Jesus that he set forth. And this is it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. He prepared the people to live by the spirit of the law. Jesus made one more preparation that we're going to focus on today and that is that he helped the people focus on the future focus on the future and before we go to the text again in mark to talk about that i want us to think about what that means to focus on the future by focus on the future we don't mean as one person said that we are so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good that's an old phrase that means that if we're only focusing on of what is going to come to the point that we neglect our everyday life, we're missing the point. God didn't call us to look to the future and avoid today. God called us to live today in light of the future. And so that's what Jesus is going to be doing here, is he's going to focus us towards the future so that we can live the day in light of the future. And we can live today in light of the future that there are going to be days to come, and for the believer, even greater days to come. But there will be trials on that way. And if I'm going to live life today and through those trials, I have a great vision of the future that is going to give me energy and joy and hope, which will all lead to endurance to live for that great day. And so let's look at that last preparation that Jesus makes for the people. This is in Mark chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 and then go over to verse 21. It says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. I said earlier that this temple would just speak to the majesty of God. And this is how one of the disciples is, is caught up. He's just looking at it. We can't blame him. Uh, but this disciple is going to be taught about something even greater. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Over to verse 21. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the, the elect. So be in your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. 
At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with a great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth and to the ends of the heavens. This is where Jesus is shifting their eyes from the present to the future. And if we look at this story in its whole, in the context, it's, okay, disciples, you see this magnificent temple, and it speaks to the glory of God, but you want to know the moment where we're really going to see the glory of God, to which, by the way, the transfiguration pointed toward. You have Jesus coming, the Son of God coming in all his glory, and the people are seeing God come and set things right. And he sets his warnings. He says there's going to be false people claiming to be the Messiah. There are going to be many ways that people think the end of the world's coming. We all know what that's like. There's been a rather difficult time in our nation and the world in the last several months. And many people think, well, is this the end of time? Well, it may be, but you think back 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, etc. There have been times throughout history people think, well, certainly this is going to be when Jesus comes back. Certainly this war or this famine or this disease or this level of crime are saying that Jesus is coming back. We simply do not know when it's coming. But we, like the disciples, are going to be future-minded so that we can be earthly good. If we're future-minded in a sense of anguish and worry, we're no good. And if we're in a sense of looking to the future in a type of euphoric dream, we are not able to be useful today. But we can, in the words of May Reeves Davis, say in the old lyrics, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. As Jesus prepares himself, as he prepares the crowds, as he prepares God's house, as he prepares his disciples, as he prepares people to see his own authority, as he prepares the people to look to the future, He's preparing all of us to realize that this world is not our home and we have to live for something far much greater and that is to live for the glory of God. So as we think about these five preparations, I, I want to ask you, are you prepared? Are you prepared not only for the future, but are you prepared for today? Are you prepared to live your everyday ordinary life today in light of what Jesus has done? If you are, then you're on the right track. You are wanting to serve God and you're seeking to know are the things that I'm doing under the umbrellas of loving God and loving neighbor? And am I doing so in light of the great hopeful future? If so, you're prepared and you're ready. If you're not, it's a great day to be prepared. It's a great day to be prepared. And I encourage you to reach out. If you have questions about this, what does it mean to have hope in Jesus? You, you can text Connect RCC. To 97,000. Connect RCC to 97000 and I or one of the other pastors will reach out to you and answer questions, pray with you, encourage you. Make sure that even though you're watching online that you can still feel connected. Not only by being back here each week and sharing this with your friends, but by contacting us so that we can make sure we're prepared together. And I encourage you to do that. Again, thank you for watching. So glad we have Robert Creek online. And I encourage you to go and have a great day serving Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What'd you get? Um, I got something interesting. Oh yeah? Something I won't order again, but I think it's something that everybody should at least experience once. It's a blueberry muffin. I had that. It's it was interesting. It was good at first, and then it was confusing and weird, much like 2020 all in itself. It was, it was nice at first, we had to worry about World War III, and then all of a sudden, virus. <laughs> That's this dream kind of up rambling. Yeah. I, I didn't get something that I would normally get, but I thought, you know what? It's the end of the year, the end of my time uh, with these guys, so I thought I might with get these guys? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? With these drinks. What kind of, what kind of drinks do you mean? Uh, cold drinks. Cold drinks? Yeah. I don't, I don't order cold drinks in months that have an R in them. Think about it. January, February, March, April. 
You don't drink September, cold drinks October, in cold months. November, it December. makes sense. It does make He's sense. He's not crazy. I'm not crazy. crazy. So, um, <laughs> it is sweather weather. And speaking of sweater weather, good morning, Rabbit Creek Church. Thank you for joining us on our YouTube or Facebook page. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, we, uh, speaking of sweater weather, we had a outdoor service last week. But luckily, in about half an hour, we won't have to do that because we can be inside due to new mandates. Meeting inside. 11 a.m. should be in like 30 minutes. Yeah, my man here is going to be leading worship because Josh so is out getting some meats. Yep. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I'm really excited to be back in, in our building and, and, and worship together in our building again. It's, it's going to be good. Yeah, when we got some upcoming events uh, that are outside of our building. Mm -hmm. um, women's retreat is coming very soon. Very soon. I don't remember what the dates are for that. What were the dates? It starts on the 18th. 18th of September. Yes, so this month. September or so. And then if you look a month ahead in the calendar, that's when the men's retreat is going to be finishing up. So men, get on that Church Center app, check out our our social media platforms that we're gonna go over in a second. Goes from the 15th to the 18th. Live really live. What a title. What a title. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have some more details for you um, this upcoming week on social media, so stay tuned to that. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And the best way to keep up to date with Rabbit Creek Church, whether you be Hillside Campus, up the campus, or online campus, we love you very, very much, is to follow us on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and our YouTube channel. If you need to keep up with any of the pastoral staff, we're gonna pop up a screen at the end of the video, giving you their information and their names so that you can get a hold of them throughout the week. And don't think I forgot about my challenge last week. Mm -hmm. If you guys made it to Gloom and got a avocado toast, then send me a message. Say how much you liked it, how much you didn't like it, whatever. Send you a message. Tell them to tell me yeah. how much you liked it. And Bloom's going to be open. Do you remember the hours? Off hours are 7.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. And they have in-house seating again. So they do. come on by, bring a friend, get a cup of something warm because it is September. There you go. And, and uh, come on by. Enjoy yourself. Yeah, absolutely. On behalf of Rabbit Creek Church, we love you. We miss you. And we can't wait to see you soon. Bye. Bye.